everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting with composer, producer, Emmy-winning music editor, and of course, bassist, Richard Ford. Yay! Thank you so much. <laughs> really happy to be talking with you. Our pleasure, our pleasure, Richard. So as always, we have so much to talk about, but we like to go to the past. How did you get started in music, and particularly on bass? Well, I came from a semi-musical family, and I started with piano, and then I went to cello, then I went to saxophone, and bass was something that I sort of decided on myself, I think. I was a choir boy as a kid, and I used to turn the pages for the organist, and the only way that I could really follow the dots was the bass line, and so things like Bach was just a joy, because and, you know, such beautiful bass lines, and I would follow the pedal notes. Mm -hmm. And it sort of got implanted in me that maybe that was an easier way to go than trying to play guitar, you know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And are you self-taught? Did you pursue further training? Uh, I'm self-taught. Yeah. I, I mean, I did get professional training with piano and saxophone, cello, but to know it just didn't work out with those instruments, <laughs> if you know what gotcha. I mean. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And you mentioned kind of that classical background with your family musical environment, but if I remember correctly, I think you were kind of more interested in more contemporary, different music. Yeah, I mean, that's that's true. Growing up when I did, I really was lucky enough to be in the era of whether it bought Herbie Hancock thrust and those those kind of albums and I learned a lot from there or I was in awe of that that music and I don't know if it's true for everybody but I think because that was a certain period of my life I've sort of carried it through with me I've listened to contemporary music as well but that's still part of the essence of my musicality I think is is hearing that kind of music yeah very, very nice. Very, very nice. And for some of you that have been paying attention back in May of 2022, I had the great honor and pleasure of getting a chance to listen to Basso Profondissimo that Richard put out. There's one and two. And just a, a lovely collection of music for music's sake. And it was just such a, a, a wide assortment of things. Tell us a little bit about that project and your inspiration behind that? <laughs> the inspiration behind Basso Profondissimo, for a long time I was working in the movie business as, as a music editor, and I wanted to do my own music, but I honestly didn't have grasp of what was going on technologically with MIDI and samples, et cetera, et cetera. And I found it very frustrating that those elements just they were out of my reach. I didn't want to go back to school. So I decided I would play everything on an instrument that I was familiar with. And because of my editing experience, Pro Tools is definitely one of my instruments as well. So I started messing with the uh, Pro Tools and basses and yeah, just sort of developed from there. Nice. And since you mentioned music editing, that is such a prominent part, well, basically what you do. How did that come about? Because you had, again, you were a musician and then music editing. I was living in New York. I came out to Los Angeles and was hoping to make it as a composer out here for film. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't have the chops, not necessarily musically, but I didn't have the social chops that were required to sort of schmooze, et cetera, et cetera, and got nowhere. And, uh, somebody needed an assistant and so I started working with her as an assistant music editor and there was a, a non-paying film that she didn't want to work on she handed it to me <laughs> and from that I ended up on Xena Warrior Princess I cut the music for that please don't listen to it it's a, it's it was early in my in my cutting <laughs> career it was horrible but I cut my teeth on it yeah and Dang. that's how I started and then just through people I worked with, bounced back and forth, and been pretty lucky to work with some great people and that wanted to hire me again, you know. <laughs> nice. Well, and I think it's it's one of those unsung things because those of us that experience, whether it's movies or television, so often we take for granted the music musical score behind it because what it does is it sets the feel. 
we're not getting bombarded with lyrics or a, a spoken message, but it makes a real a real difference. And even to a point where I think it's almost subconsciously Pavlovian, where one of the ones that always comes to mind for me is the Mandalorian, because when you hear the even just the opening music, you're ready, you're getting ready, like, okay, here we go with the Mandalorian. And as the uh -huh. tones come in and it, you're, it just kind of completes the whole thing. And if you ever listen to something with no music behind it, you're, you're kind of like, well, that's kind of flat. It is a rather doldrum, but it, you know, it, it, it is something that changes so much the, the taste of what we experience. Definitely, definitely. But there, there was a film which didn't have any music in by Gus Van Zandt about two people walking through the desert. And it was one of the scariest things I can remember because all you heard were footprints and it was stark, just like the desert. You heard people walking for like three or four minutes, just the footprints and I'm getting chills talking about it. But that's definitely the exception. And there are times when the film isn't quite up to snuff mm -hmm. and they want to add a little romance to a scene where there really isn't any chemistry. So you start putting a little sugar and honey underneath it. It makes all the difference. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I think translating that even forward, a lot of times we will gravitate to music as the soundtrack to our own experiences in life. Yes. And so I know like when we are doing a road trip, we can throw in a, a particular CD mm. and now we have our soundtrack for here we go down the road. Or when I used to commute to work, I had a particular soundtrack of here I go to work. And then I had another was here I come, at least I get to go home, I'm free. And now the <laughs> celebratory tunes that go with it as I'm sitting in traffic trying to get back. Yeah, right. But, right. but it has such a, a huge and profound effect. And again, I, I hope that people hearing this and listening, maybe will even pay a little more attention to that music in the background and go, oh, well, there. There, that that is somebody has been you know very conscientiously making choices. Yes, that yeah. that's so fabulous. And getting back to your own music, gear wise, how are you getting your sound? What are you playing on? Uh, well, I have uh, a few bases. I've got some old Fenders, an old nineteen sixty Precision that the frets came out of years and years ago, <laughs> and so that's one of one of the highlights of my few bases. And I've got a couple of Federa six strings that I picked up actually in the late 80s. I was playing with Joe Jackson on the road and yeah, I ended up with these two beautiful six string basses, a fretless and a fretted, and they've stayed with me. They really have, they sound great to my ears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I plug straight in, I go direct into the box mm -hmm. and then mess around with sounds afterwards. But the natural sound of particularly the, the fretless P bass, yeah, it's just a beautiful thing. Just sounds so rich and yeah, it's got like a little mini envelope to it at times. Yeah, love it. Nice. Yeah. Well, and it is one of those in the random selection of things. These musical instruments, when they leave their the shop, they have the whole life of their own and they will have climate change. They will have humidity changes. As you mentioned, they might have started with frets and had them taken out. Somebody tweaked along the way. Somebody's done. One of my favorite bass stories, oh, Andy Shishon, who plays with Billy Joel, has, just like yourself, he has some Fuderas that are amazing. And those, you know, total credit towards those basses. But he has an old Fender that is this grimy, grungy bass. And if you close your eyes and you run your hand along the back of the neck, you're, you're going to feel a divot for your thumb at B because there's been so much like B blues played on that bass that it's, it's like finding the middle key on the telephone, that there was a little spike that would stick up for you to find it in the dark. You can find B just by running your thumb on the back of it. And he will not clean it. 
He will not do anything to it. It has, it's dialed in on its mojo and he doesn't want to affect it adversely in any way, shape or form. So it has the cigarette smoke, the spilled beer, everything possible is on <laughs> that base. It's and, sacred. Yeah. And it takes the stage alongside with these amazing Federas because there are tunes that he goes, this is the sound. This has the voice that I want for this particular piece. I found that I was I was playing the six strings more than anything else for a little while, and they are they're a bit of a challenge, mm -hmm. and they they're just not not straightforward certainly. And then I picked up an old Fender that I had, and it was like it just felt like coming home. It really was. It just feels so good. I want to tell a story about the fretless bass, how it came about. I was on the road with a band, my first pro gig. We were playing in Scotland. Mm. And like a bunch of newbies, we left all our bases. There was a 56 Strat and a 61 Telecaster and my 64 Precision all got stolen out the back of the car. Oh. Everything went. And so we played a couple of gigs on borrowed gear and then came across a second hand shop in Manchester in, in England. And they had this precision and I said to my guitarist friend just take the frets out let's I'm just gonna go forward like that and that's how it so it, it was a real drag having everything stolen but from that came learning how to play with a different sound and it was yeah it's been great absolutely <laughs> so I, I, I love fretted as well don't get me wrong but fretless yeah was really quite a discovery for me nice well and it is it is such a it is such a difference and and the nuances you can get with fretless are so distinctive that it requires again i think it i, I look at it as almost a whole different instrument but it, it does open especially for the players that do a lot of the middle eastern scales yeah. and things where you've got half notes and things in between if you have frets you you don't get those fretless you have the whole color palette available to you there's a piece that I've been working on. It hasn't, I haven't finished it yet. But where I didn't plug the bass in, I recorded the fretless with a microphone right next to the. It, the microphone was right next to the strings, and it sounds like a sitar. It's just, it's really interesting what you can get out of these things. Really <laughs> nice, nice. So, anyway. so as we look forward, what's in the works? What do we have planned? Well, I have about six or seven tunes that are sort of in in process right now and much like yourself I actually moved houses last year and I didn't realize how much time and energy and emotional emotional energy that, that takes up and so <laughs> they've been sort of sitting uh, sitting on a hard drive I'm just now starting to get back into them so I plan to have a, at least an EP out later this year with a few pieces on and a lot of my energy also has been working with a, a film composer uh, from Portland that I've been working with quite a bit. And a um, film that we just finished called The Whole Lovers, we're working, we're producing a soundtrack. And what we did, we worked on a film called Nebraska a few years ago. And score pieces are generally about 20, 30 seconds, sometimes a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. And to make an album of that stuff is pretty boring because nothing nothing develops so we spent yeah. a while working developing that score into three four minute pieces and we want to do the same with this piece that we just finished so that's immediate future but as far as basso profondissimo goes something later in the year that's my plan very Whatever nice yeah i don't know when i must say with with basso profondissimo 2 there are nine pieces on there and that's a that's a lot of work, especially when you are doing everything bit by bit mm -hmm. and quite slowly in, 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 in the way I work. And I don't really want to, I, I want, I'd rather release three or four things at a time or maybe even one thing at a time because we're not talking album format anymore. Yeah. Everyone listens digitally and that's sadly the way, the way it is, but it energy wise, it's, great to put your energy into one or two things 
and then move on. That's my experience anyway. <laughs> I got you. Well, we have so changed how we listen to music. Every Those of us that have been around for a while, which, by the way, a happy belated birthday to you as we're speaking. Well, and your birthday, happy birthday today. Hey, big celebration. It's snowing outside yours, please. <laughs> there we go. But back to what I was saying, records. We used to purchase a record, you'd get an LP, and usually it was because it had that one song that you really liked and you hadn't heard any of the others because most places didn't let you listen to the music before you purchased, but you knew it had the one song you liked. And if you were lucky you might come up with a bunch of ones that were really good. Now, I think one of the classic examples is Michael Jackson's Bad is just chock-loaded with things that were huge. So you got an awful lot, but I can't tell you how many records I have that I got it for this one song, and then I was kind of like, well, what was I thinking with all these other things? <laughs> they're they're, they're yes. only so-so, but with singles like this, you, you can kind of hit mm -hmm. and you can also kind of gauge responses to if something really takes off. You might go, OK, the next one, I maybe will do a little bit of that kind of thing, kind of playing with it. And so it's, it's very fascinating. If people want to stay on top of what you're doing, though, they can go to basoprofundissimo.com. That's me. And on social media, you're on Spotify, Facebook under Richard Ford Music, Basso Profundissimo. On Instagram, Richard underscore Ford underscore Music. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the thanks for the promo plug. I already appreciate it. <laughs> well, people need to know how to find you. That's the thing. As we're talking about something, they might go, "What are what are these guys talking about?" Now they have the address. They can find it on their very own. Well, Very good. well, thank you. Richard, appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and chat with me. Folks, you've seen him here on Bass Musician Magazine, Richard Ford. Thank you so much, Raul. It's been such a pleasure. Mm -hmm.